This morning, we're going to look further in some of the thoughts from John's gospel and specifically some of the, the sets of seven that he brings out or that Christ brings out in, you know, in the I am's that he gives and the seven I am's, the seven discourses that he gives and the seven signs or the miracles. And today we're going to look at the second I am where he declares, I am the light of the world. And also in these chapters uh, in John chapter eight and nine, he also gives his sixth discourse, which is the discourse on the light of the world. But there's also in this, uh, in this section, there's the sixth sign, which is the healing of the man who's born blind. And then he's, he's made to see, we won't actually get to that. We're going to, we might split this up into, into two, but the message is that he is the light. He came to earth to be a light for mankind. And, you know, even at the beginning of his ministry, it's recorded in Matthew that, that Jesus left Nazareth to go out and minister in Galilee and in Israel as a fulfillment. It was actually a, he literally says it was a fulfillment of Isaiah, um, of the prophet. And he, he's quoting Isaiah 9 and verse 2, but he says this in, in Matthew 4 and verse 16. He says, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region, the shadow of death, light is sprung up. And so the going forth of the Messiah was to bring light to that region. And ultimately, it was light to the world. You know, when the gospel was spreading out from, from Jerusalem, it was really light shining forth. You know, sometimes we think of like in, in science, the speed of light. Well, it was the speed of the gospel going out that was bringing light to the nations, light to mankind. And we're still basking in that light today because of Jesus who went forth. In reality, he's the light of all things. Right? You know, he's described in, in Malachi 4.2, he's the son of righteousness, the S-U-N of righteousness, right? And he's going to arise with healing in his wings. And so his, his you could say the, the rays of light from Christ affect us in the spiritual, they give us spiritual light, but natural light too, because it affects our bodies as he releases healing and according to his mercy and by his stripes. You know, even in, in, uh, in the future, we can read about Christ and what it says in the ages to come, because we know we're in the age of the church and then comes the age of the millennial reign of Christ. But there's ages to come. And what's described in those ages is, is the city, the new Jerusalem, and it's interesting how it's described in Jerusalem in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, verse 23. It's, it says, This city has no need of the sun. And why is that? It's because Christ is there. Doesn't need the moon to shine for it, for the glory of God does lighten it, and the Lamb is the light. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, the kings of the earth do bring their glory to honor unto it. And so for those who follow the Lamb, they have the privilege of walking in the, the holy city. And I, I love that phrase, the Lamb is the light. That's really what, what it is as Christ of the world. At Christ as the light of the world, the Lamb is our light. And it's in a spiritual sense in this life, but it's actually going to be in a natural sense in the ages to come. And I don't know how that's going to work, you know, in the, in the, if it's just going to be a, a glow around, you know, there's no sun in the sky, but yet light will, you know, his light will illuminate everything for us. You know, if we're in a, in a room with no windows, I don't know if the molecules are going to glow, but somehow we don't, we don't need light bulbs in the new Jerusalem, but it's because Christ is the source of light. Now, before we actually get into this, what Christ is saying as the I am in the discourse, I want to, to look at the context that this is given in, in chapter eight, because before we get to the I am, it's actually, this is based on an account that is given here in this chapter. And it, it starts off in, in John eight and verse two, where it says, early in the morning, Jesus came into the temple 
And all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. And, and so we kind of see he's acting as the light. That was his constant purpose is he's, you know, he's coming to bring light, to teach. And so he comes early in the temple, almost like you get the thought of the sun is rising in the sky, but it's also arising upon his people because he's coming early to shine his light upon his people through his teaching. And of course, there were those who opposed him, they, but, but it's really, we're going to see it's because they didn't love, they don't love the light. And so, you know, the, the Pharisees, they think, well, maybe we can catch him. Let's see if we can catch him up and, you know, get, use his words against him. So what they did is they found, you know, we, we read the story of the woman caught in adultery and they bring her. I don't know why they didn't bring the man. They just said, well, we'll let's just bring the woman. The man was exempt, I guess. But they, they bring this woman and they thought, well, well, we'll catch him because according to the law, she should die. And so they fr- confronted Jesus and they asked, should she die or should she live? And, you know, basically, if, if he said, well, she should live, then they could turn his words against him, say, you're not upholding the law. But if he said, well, she should die, then they could say, well, it was by his words that he condemned. And so he's condemning people to death through his words. You know, they had a very violent spirit and they were trying to get him to flow with that, with that spirit. But, you know, we know the story. He bent down and he wrote in the dust and they kept asking and he wasn't giving a response until, you know, he stood up. But, you know, what they didn't know is he had a secret weapon. You know, he is the light of the world. And they didn't know they were about to be exposed to his light. And he gave a very unexpected response, and that flipped the switch of his spotlight. And so he said this in verse 7, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Now, sometimes you, you read this and you think, well, he just set them about to reason in their hearts. And, you know, they just reason, oh, you know what? He's right. I, I, I don't, I'm not without sin. What am I doing trying to cast this stone? You know, I don't think that's the case because I don't think they were a very reasonable group. It's not reasonable to try and bring this woman caught in adultery to try and, you know, trip up someone's words. You know, they didn't have love in their heart. But I believe what took place was that the Lord stood up and he made that statement. And it was as if something was happening in the spirit. The light of the world started to blaze upon their conscience. And they recoiled from that light. And when I was studying this, I'd never really considered that. I almost laughed out loud that they could not stand in front of that light. They, they, they came thinking, ah, we're going to catch him. And little did they know, the Lord just stood up and flipped the light on and they went scattering like cockroaches, you know, turned the light on and the, whoop, they scurried away. And he's standing there as the light of the world. And then Jesus was able to judge according to the law because, right, the law says no one can be judged unless there's two or three witnesses. And so he asked the woman in, in verse 10, he said, women, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she responded, no one, Lord. And so Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so immediately after this story, he proclaims, I am the light of the world. That's why it's important to understand the the context in which it's given. You know, that... In, in this, we're seeing that his light is so much more than just the law or truth. It's really the light of who he is. It's all encompassing. It's the light of truth, but it's also the light of love, of compassion, of forgiveness, all rolled into one. And, and even more than that, it's a call or an invitation to, you know, the, to come and be people of the light. And, you know, we're, we're going to see that some do not come to him, but it's really for one reason, because they do not love the light. In fact, they love darkness. And because of that, they recoil. 
you know, without him, we're on our own, you know, going our own way, adrift, you could say, in a sea of darkness. You know, perhaps some of us remember what it was like to live without Christ. And it, it's just, it's an aimless life. And some try to make their own system of do's and don'ts of good and bad and, and so forth. But Christ came to be our light and to bring us to that place where we can walk in his light and have fellowship with him. And, and actually, when you look at his discourse, he actually, as he's sharing it, you realize there's a progression in experiencing the light of Christ as, as he is sharing. It's kind of subtle, but it's there. And the first step that he shares is that we have to be those who come into the light, who are willing to open the door of our hearts and let his light shine in. And so we read in verse 12, it says, Jesus spoke unto them saying, I am the light of the world. And he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And, you know, those who are in the world without Christ, they walk in darkness. And so when we first come to him, it's like, you know, we're coming out of darkness into life, but yet we're also like a newborn baby that comes out of the womb and all of a sudden they open their eyes. It's like, ooh, it's a whole new world. I'm, you know, you're not seeing new because you never saw. Light comes in where there was darkness. And as our eyes are open, we, we see with a new sight. And, you know, those without Christ, it's, it's like they ha- obviously they haven't been born again, as, we, as Jesus shared in, in John, you know, earlier in the, in the gospel. And so their eyes are closed and, and they just literally, they cannot understand. In fact, there was a story of a believer who was you know, spirit filled and they were talking to someone who was not saved. But the person they were talking to was a brilliant person. They were, I think they were a scientist, as the story goes. And they were conversing with him. And, and this person was so intelligent and understanding. But then they said, as the conversation turned to a spiritual matter, they said they saw something take place in the spiritual realm. They said they, as they were talking to him about a spiritual matter, it was like a veil came over this, this brilliant person and came over their face, and they could not understand anything of what this spirit-filled believer was trying to communicate to them about the spiritual world. But it's because their eyes are are closed to Christ. They have no light until they open their heart to Christ, who is the light of the world. And that's really the key. It's it's coming into the light, and, and really that first step is that surrender to the light. You know, a willingness to have our mind bypassed and exposing our heart to the light of Christ. And, of course, the problem with that, you know, you would think everyone would love to come into the, the nice warm sunshine out of the cold. Well, there's a problem. And that's what Jesus proclaimed in John chapter 3 and verse 19. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That is the root issue that, you know, light has come, but they love darkness. And so they don't want to come into the light because it'll expose the dark, their dark deeds. And so this life is really an opportunity to develop a love for the light of Christ, the light of the world, but it's a, it's a decision in life that everyone has to make. And, you know, and sometimes it's, it's just hard to understand why would they not love the light given the opportunity? But, you know, someone, or uh, I think it's uh, Dr. Paul Karam in one of his books, he shares a story of uh, a certain man who throughout his life, he resisted God, he resisted the gospel. And, uh, but, but yet he didn't feel it was fair. And at the end of his life, he was taken down into hell and someone had a vision of this. They're sharing this. And they said in hell, he was so bitter against God, proclaiming how unjust God was for, for sending him to hell, you know, that, that, you know, if he had had more opportunity, he would have chosen to follow the Lord. And so in this vision, 
the, the, the Lord responded to him and said, okay, I'll give you an opportunity. And an angel started to take him up to heaven. And what happened is that as he was brought up to heaven, he got closer and closer and the light became so intense that all of a sudden he started to plead and scream, take me back down to hell. I can't stand the light. The light was too horrible for him. And you know, there's that, that concept, people who love darkness will never be comfortable in heaven because they have not loved the light on earth. And so the, really the first key is to open our hearts and surrender to his light while we're on earth so that we can live in that light for eternity. But as I mentioned, there's a progression that we can see in, in his discourse and his teaching on this. And, you know, because as we come into the light and we begin to see, there's that commandment to walk in the light and continue in the light. That's our calling. And, you know, we could reference a couple of verses um, in, in the New Testament. You know, Paul said in Ephesians 5 and verse 8, he said to his churches, you know, some, you were sometimes in darkness, but now you, <clears throat> but now are you in the light of the Lord, or now are you in light in the Lord, walk as children of the light. And so Paul is writing to these blood-washed believers who they're in the church. And so he's saying, you have been taken out of darkness, but your purpose now must be to walk in the light of Christ. Also, John wrote in one of his letters, 1 John 1, 7, that familiar verse is, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so true fellowship with Jesus and each other comes as we walk in the light of the presence of Christ. And in that we're continually cleansed and we're changed and transformed. And, and so what Jesus is really saying is it means that, you know, to walk in the light, we have to progress and follow the lamb. And he shares this in his discourse in John 8, 31. It says, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, and they said, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, here is the real key to progressing in Christ. It really comes, you know, in, in that thought of being a disciple. It's to continue in his word, which in so doing, we're walking in the light. We're continuing in his light. Now, Pastor Bailey, in one of his commentaries, he expressed it this way. He said, one experience with God is not sufficient. You know, we have to walk in the pathway of righteousness for the rest of our lives until that day when we are received into heaven. I think we can understand that, you know, if we have an experience where we came into a room and we flipped on the light, hallelujah, I'm in the light. But if for the rest of our lives, we never flip that switch on, or maybe we just keep it on only on Sunday, but the rest of the, rest of the week, we keep it off. That's not quite what Jesus is saying. He's saying, those who want, seek would be my disciples are to continue in my word, to walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, some of the, the Jews there kind of took offense at this, at what some of the things he was saying, right? Because Jesus was saying, you can be free. And so some of the Jews said, we're not in bondage, right? We're Abraham's children. And this is what Jesus said. In John 8, 34, then he answered and he said, truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so true freedom is found in allowing the light to shine in every area of our heart. You know, I think a, a good illustration of this is, you know, that we can understand the light of Christ and how it affects our lives is the thought of a house is that when we, when we come to Christ, 
we throw that door open and we welcome him in, you know, as the light to shine and, and he comes into the entryway. But, you know, you, you wouldn't want to bring a guest in and say, well, this entryway is yours, but the, the rest of the house, no, you can't come in there. I, I think we can understand that, you know, especially if, if, if you're bringing in a guest who is your Lord, or maybe another way to know he's, he's our bridegroom, is the one we want to be joined with for all eternity. You know, that we don't want to limit him. But of course, sometimes we have those hidden places, right? Because I'm sure some of us have, have invited a guest in. And so, well, I need to clean up. There's a closet. Let's just shove all the junk in there. And we'll hope they never open that closet in their whole time staying there. But sometimes we have those hidden places and we say, Lord, don't look in that closet. Don't look in that area of my heart. You know, I'm just, I'm going to keep that separated. But yet that's not walking in the light, is it? That's having that place where the light doesn't shine and it's not exposed. And so, of course, the Lord responds, yes, I do. <laughs> Open that so I can shine my light in there and see what's in there. And of course, when it's exposed, then we have to clean it out. Then we have to let him work. And so that's the great danger of the Christian life, you know, because you know, we can have an area where crisis come, comes in and he cleans us in one area and then he cleans us in another area. But sometimes he gets to an area that's really, Lord, are you sure you really need to do that? Or an area that's really challenging. But if we're willing, he'll cleanse us. The light will shine. He'll transform us to walk and to follow him as a disciple. But the danger is we don't want sin to remain because we know, as the scriptures say, we can't follow two masters. Eventually, one master has to win. The servants don't abide forever, but the sons and daughters, they abide forever. And here, of course, is how we can stay in the light. John eight twenty nine says, He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And of course, Christ is, is the pattern. You know, he set the example for us to follow. And here is how we can be also be can become true sons and daughters, is if this becomes the cry of our heart. Lord, help me to do the, always do those things that please you, because that means we're walking in the light. <laughs> But then there's, there's a final, that, that final progression that we can see in this discourse. And, and it's the idea that, that the light or understanding and seeing in his kingdom comes through relationship. And, you know, Pastor Billy would often say this, revelation comes through relationship. Understanding Christ and his plan th for our lives and how we can how we can please him, how we can do his will and follow the lamb comes through relationship. And he brings out something interesting in John chapter eight and verse 56. He said to the Jews, he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. That's interesting to reference father Abraham, but not, not just say that, but to say he rejoiced when he saw my day. Now, Abraham is considered the father of our faith, but he was also a man of vision. But it's because he had an intimate relationship with the one he followed. And we know that because James called him the friend of God in James chapter 2. We can also see the story in, in Genesis 18 when the Lord himself appears to Abraham and, and they have communion together. It's a communion meal. And he shares with him the promises of Isaac being born. And it's really a, a remarkable account when you consider it of, you know, there's only, uh, well, there's very few people that have a, actually have a meal with, with God. Um, and there's only two people there who are called friends of God in scripture. It's Abraham and the disciples. And both are groups that had a communion meal, a communion fellowship with the Lord. And, you know, that's the calling of a disciples. 
of, of a disciple. You know, we are his friends if we do what he commands us, but it's really through a communion relationship. And then the Lord uh, said in, in Genesis 18, verse 17, concerning uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do? And so it's, like, it's the thought that, that Abraham was the friend of God and he wasn't going to hide something from his friend. And so Abraham was able to know the secret things, the things, the plan of God because of that communion relationship. And, and so Abraham was able to intercede for Lot. And Lord, if there's even, it finally got down to 10. Lord, if there's even 10 in that city, will you spare it? And the Lord said, I'll spare it for 10. And of course, we know the story. The Lord couldn't find 10. He could only find Lot and his two daughters. And so, you know, I think I'll, I'll, mostly for, for, for the sake of Abraham, he had to pull, he literally pulled, his angels pulled Lot out of, of that destruction. But it was really because of the communion relationship of Abraham. But coming back to Jesus' words, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, you know? And so it seems as if that Abraham was able to see the life and ministry of Jesus, you know, and probably in vision form. And it was that relationship that caused Abraham to see, to have that light, you know, to, to see the hidden purposes of God, the secret things. But, you know, isn't that what you share with those who are closest to you? Right? With your spouse or your best friend, you share the secret things of your heart, the things you value most, and it's the same with God. I'll share one last thought here as we close, of, and it's how we can see in God's kingdom, how we can have his perspective. You know, our calling is to sit with him in heavenly places and see as he sees in life. But to do that, we have to have the light of Christ and see through his light, his perspective. And it's the thought that, that in this life, we don't see through our natural eyes, right? We, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. And so how do we see? Well, actually, we see through our ears. You know, as we listen to his word, we gain spiritual sight. And Jesus said this in, in John 8, 43. He said this to the Jews almost as a lament. Why do you not understand my speech? Is it even because you cannot hear my words? You know, the Jews could not understand. They remained blind and ignorant because they could not hear. And one of the verses I pray for regularly, really every day, is, is some verses in Isaiah chapter 50 which is prophetic of Christ and his life, actually. And we could read this here in closing. Isaiah 50 in verse 4, it says, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. And how does he know how to speak? How does he get that perspective? It's because he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I didn't turn astray. And so you get that, that prophetic picture of the communion relationship of Christ with the Father. It's that morning by morning, Christ came to his Father and his ear was opened and he knew exactly what he was to do. You know, one morning he, he went to his Father and you probably heard, well, you're going to go through Samaria and you're going to talk to a woman at the well. And the result of, his, of him hearing from his father that day was a whole city received him. You know, but, but that's the pattern for our lives. And how can we experience the light of the world is by walking in him in that same progression that he showed is by opening our hearts to his light. And ultimately, it's that communion relationship where that light fully comes and we can walk in the light. But it's that simple prayer, Lord, awaken my ear so that I will see with your light, with your eyes.
And so we're grateful today that he is the light of the world. And he's given us the privilege of seeing with new eyes if we're looking with eyes of faith. But we realize that, that, ex that experiencing the fullness of his light, it comes with that act of surrender. Lord, I'm going to surrender to your light. Because we realize as his light shines, it exposes the darkness and things have to change. But it's also continual that we're, we're committing, Lord, I'm going to walk in the light as you are in the light and you're leading me in that. And in that, I'm going to change. But we have that blessed promise that as we develop that communion relationship through our walk and continually crying, Lord, open my ear to hear as the learned. And we walk in that. That's the pathway of light to becoming the friend.